Friday, March the 4th, and uh, we've lost an additional 59 people. I think you'll see that the numbers are getting a lot, lot, lot better, the hospitalizations and all the, all the, all the numbers as I get into them, I think you'll see they're getting a lot better. We knew that the deaths were going to continue and we're going to trail the numbers just a little bit. We're surely, surely hopeful that this, is, this trend is really going to change and we, we feel confident that it is. Uh, but nevertheless, this is tough going. For 59, you know, 59 families and 59, you know, bunches of great friends and everything to these 59 people that we've lost. So join me in your respect, join me in your honor for them, and join me in your prayer. But, uh, you know, or join me in my prayers for all these great people. The 6,382nd death is a 60-year-old female from Kanawha County. The 6,383rd death, a 78-year-old male from Doddridge County. The 6,384th death, an 82-year-old male from Greenbrier County. The 6,385th death, a 97-year-old male from Kanawha County. The 6,386th death, an 81-year-old female from Marion County. The 6,387th death, a 73-year-old female from Kanawha County. The 6,388th death, a 39-year-old male from Greenbrier County. The 6,389th death, a 71-year-old male from Jackson County. The 6,390th death, an 80-year-old male from Mason County. The 6,391st death, a 73-year-old female from Harrison County. The 6,392nd death, a 64-year-old male from Taylor County. The 6,393rd death, a 69-year-old female from Wyoming County. The 6,394th death, a 68-year-old male from Monongahela County. The 6,395th death, a 70-year-old female from Cabell County. The 6,396th death, a 77-year-old male from Ohio County. The 6,397th death, a 77-year-old male from Boone County. The 6,398th death, an 82-year-old female from Harrison County. The 6,399th death, an 84-year-old male from Monongahela County. The 6,400th death, a 68-year-old female from Raleigh County. The 6,401st death, an 83-year-old male from Wayne County. The 6,402nd death, a 61-year-old male from Brook County. The 6,403rd death, an 80-year-old female from Wayne County. The 6,404th death, an 82-year-old female from Jefferson County. The 6,405th death, a 60-year-old male from Boone County. The 6,406th death, a 59-year-old male from Wetzel County. The 6,407th death, a 76-year-old female from, from Marshall County. The 6,408th death, a 74-year-old female from Morgan County. The 6,409th death, a 65-year-old female from Jefferson County. The 6,410th death, an 86-year-old male from Jefferson County. The 6411th death, a 66-year-old female from Kanawha County. The 6412th death, an 83-year-old female from Mercer County. The 6413th death, an 83-year-old male from Randolph County. The 6414th death, a 93-year-old female from Harrison County. The 6415th death, a 79-year-old female from Marion County. The 6416th death, an 89-year-old male from Greenbrier County. The 6417th death, a 69-year-old female from Greenbrier County. The 6418th death, a 95-year-old male from Raleigh County. The 6419th death, a 77-year-old male from Wayne County. The 6420th death, a 73-year-old female from Summers County. The 6,421st death, a 48-year-old female from Wayne County. The 6,422nd death, a 42-year-old male from Mingo County. The 6,423rd death, a 70-year-old female from Kanawha County. The 6,424th death, a 72-year-old male from Lincoln County. 
The 6,425th death, a 78-year-old female from Putnam County. The 6,426th death, a 74-year-old male from Wyoming County. The 6,427th death, an 85-year-old male from Hancock County. The 6,428th death, a 70, a 67-year-old male from Mercer County. The 6,429th death, a 66-year-old male from Berkeley County. The 6,430th death, a 50-year-old female from Fayette County. The 6,431st death, a 69-year-old female from Marion County. The 6,432nd death, a 79-year-old female from Logan County. The 6,433rd death, a 76-year-old male from Cabell County. The 6,434th death, a 66-year-old male from Upshur County. The 6,435th death, a 59-year-old female from Preston County. The 6,436th death, a 71-year-old female from Berkeley County. The 6,437th death, a 66-year-old female from Upshur County. The 6,438th death, an 86-year-old female from Marion County. The 6,439th death is an 89-year-old female from Logan County. The 6,440th death in West Virginia is a 66-year-old male from Logan County. La, 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 folks, we've lost. It's incredible. 6,440 people have perished in this pandemic in West Virginia alone. It's really sad. Really, really sad. Here's something that I, I, I would have never believed. I'd have never believed that I'd be here in front of you two years from when this all started. I would have never, ever thought in any way that this could possibly last for two years. Two years ago, two years ago, I issued our state preparedness at that time and, and gathered all my administration together to discuss all the next moves. And even though it's been something that I can't believe has lasted that long, I remember it like it was yesterday. People were really scrambling around. We did not have a detected case at that time in the state of West Virginia. But we knew we had to get ready, did we not? So we got to work early, early on. And absolutely, we stayed ahead of the curve. West Virginia became the envy of the nation, to tell you the truth, if not the world. Here we were out in front of everybody because we gathered all the players together, the National Guard, the DHHR, all the people that could absolutely you know, give us real input into what's going on. Then we brought on Dr. Marsh, you know, who has absolutely been just such a superstar. Dr. Amjad came not long after that. General Hoyer was our general at the time, you know, with our National Guard and what an incredible job he's done. And now what an incredible job he continues to do. You know, with all of that, West Virginia, the place where this was supposed to wipe us completely off the map, it could have, it could have. We were a place that was the third oldest state in the nation and a state with absolutely the most chronic illnesses of any state. And a state not located out in the west like a Wyoming or something like that at South Dakota. A state that was surrounded on all sides by big populations of people. And those people would be coming through West Virginia. And many, many, many of them would be positive with this terrible disease. With all of that, the oldest almost, and the most chronically ill, we stayed ahead of the curve. And I really want to just take just this second to thank all those that out there that really did an incredible work. You ran to the fire, did you not? All of our first responders, all those in the health community, all across the board, the people that worked at the grocery stores, all West Virginians kept pulling the rope together. 
This could have been a catastrophe beyond possible belief. It could have been, it, it, it could have been a catastrophe that we would have absolutely, it, 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 it would have been just completely horrible. We stayed ahead, did we not? We kept working. 440 people that have died right now in West Virginia. But really and truly, we all know, we all know just how bad that this could have been. So with all that, again, I thank all those. I could never, ever thank you enough. I thank you for West Virginians, West Virginians that needed you in a time of need. And you've done what we've done over and over and over and over from the beginning of time almost. You absolutely stepped up, didn't you? And so I thank you. Standing with you has been a real honor. And we're going to get through this. It's not been easy, that's for sure. And it's been long. But we're going to get through it. And I thank you so much. We now have 2,088 cases, active cases in West Virginia, and that's a number that's good. I mean, we don't want any naturally, but you know, to tell you the truth, that's a heck of a lot better than where we've been. We have 578 new positive cases in West Virginia, another good number. We have a daily positivity rate of 4.36, another really good number. Our cumulative rate has started to decline a little teeny bit. We're at 8.38% now. We have recovered cases in West Virginia of 483,748 cases. We're down in the 400s on hospitalization, or people that are hospitalized. 481, we have 124 in the ICU units and 64 on ventilators. For the most part, our map is almost all green. And, uh, you know, we want it to be all green and then absolutely just get it better and better and better. Our numbers from the standpoint are slightly, slightly better. I want to jump to them real quick here just for a second, but what I'm referring to is now, for those folks that have received at least one shot that are 18 years of age and older, 18 years of age and older, we're at 71.5% of those people that have received one shot. Now, I really believe heartily that if you stepped up and got yourself vaccinated with one shot, overwhelmingly, we ought to be able to get you across the finish line to get your second shot and or your booster shot. We have now given out 413,165 booster shots. It's not nearly as good as what we want, but it's a heck of a lot better than where it was. But here's another number that is really nice, is we're at 65.7% of the folks that are five years old and older that have received one shot. So really and true, we've got a bunch of our kids now that we've, been, that we've been able to vaccinate, and that's really good too. I remind you over and over about getting your booster shots, especially if you're 50 and older, for crying out loud, and you've, got, you've stepped up and got yourself fully vaccinated in the first two shots and everything. How on this planet could you not listen to Dr. Clay Marsh and Dr. Amja when they say to you, if you're six months out from when you've gotten that, uh, really, I think it's five months out from when you've gotten that second, you know, uh, vaccination shot, or if it's J and J, I think it's two months out. But if you're that, if you're, let's just uh, stick with that and say, if you're five months out from that and you have not gotten your booster shot for all practical purposes, you might as well, might as well have never ever gotten vaccinated. You made the decision to get vaccinated. For crying out loud, you have got to get this booster shot. Everybody in the world, what they're telling you is to absolutely, we can't promise you you won't get this, but we can absolutely give you incredible assurance that really with that booster shot, that you won't end up in the hospital and maybe, and, and you absolutely won't end up one of these statistics that I'm, I'm reading. Now, we can't guarantee anything, can we? And we want to be upfront and as honest with you as we possibly can. But you got to get that booster shot. Absolutely, with all in me, I am telling you from my standpoint, from Jim Justice to you, if 
you trust in me, if you believe in what I've told you to be the truth all the way down the road, and I sure have done that, you know, then get that booster shot. All the COVID information is up on, on our website and everything, and, uh, and as far as all the free testing, I urge you to take advantage, take advantage of all that. You know, we thank Fruits, we thank Walgreens over and over. They've, they've really been great partners along the way. Um, our long-term care facilities, we have 134 outbreaks. That's still not great, but it's better than it was. We have no outbreaks in our church communities. That's really good. We're down to 74 inmate cases and 20 staff cases in corrections, and that's one whale of a lot better than where it was before. I remind you about giving blood. It's really, really, really important. And you really probably ch ought to check with your physician. And, and at the end of the day, you know, if, especially if you've had this dreaded disease and everything, I just feel like, you know, it's, it's almost, uh, it's just something you've got to consider. That's just all there is to it. You know, as far as the home tests, you know, that, uh, that uh, are free and available to you through the Biden administration, you know, if you'll go to our covidtest.gov and uh, it'll, it'll tell you how to get those uh, kits and everything where you'll have those home tests and you're free in 95 masks and praise the Lord, I don't think, I hope to goodness above that we, we absolutely don't have to hack up with these masks. But, uh, but you know, from the standpoint, if you're, if you're older, you got a bunch of chronic illnesses or problems, you still may want to consider that in a crowd of people that are indoors that you don't know. They're available to pharmacies and at the community centers. I've told you over and over about the rental assistance program. If you'll contact us and you're renting and we can get you qualified, we'll put some money in your pocket. And the same way with landlords, if you can contact us and say, here was my shortfall and everything and we can walk you through it, we may very well be able to get you qualified. If we get you qualified, we'll put some money in your pocket too. So anyway, nevertheless, the only last thing I've got is our Jump Start program, Jobs Jump Start program is, is up and, and it's working. We've just mimicked uh, Oklahoma. It worked well in Oklahoma to get more and more and more people back into the workforce. And, uh, and so all that's really good. And uh, the last thing I guess that I want to announce to you is, is just this is I've taken my time because I really believe that our, our natural resources and all the components that go with that, the hiring and selection of the head that's going to head up the DNR is a tremendously important decision in my book that I need to make. Now, with all that, we're, we're really delighted that Steve McDaniel is going to stay on as a senior advisor. I think Steve did an incredible job. We can never thank him enough for all the great work that Steve did. And, and Steve and I really bingoed off one another, and it was really good and everything. And I hope we'll continue to, to do the same. But I've really been thinking an awful lot about this, and, and, and I've been through... Uh, you know, positive, negative feelings and everything with a lot of different folks and everything. But I think now that I am very, very comfortable that I am selecting the right man for the job. I thought about some ladies. I thought about different men. I thought about uh, people that have been in private business, people that have been with us for a long time and everything, people that really could balance all the great stuff that we want to do with our wildlife and enforcement and all the different things as well as the great stuff we're doing with our parks and tourism and, and all that blend together. I had lots of conversations with, you know, Ed Gaunch, you know, our Secretary of Commerce, Chelsea Ruby, Secretary of Tourism, lots of different people along the way and everything. But I've picked the right guy for the job now, and that's Brett McMillian. And Brett, we congratulate you. Brett's been in our system with the parks for 25 years. He's done an incredible job. He's a little bit smaller guy than I am and everything, but, uh, but, but you know, a lot of people are and everything, but that's us right there, and I congratulate him in every way. I know he'll do a wonderful, wonderful job. You know, Brett's got an incredible family and everything. They do phenomenal work. He's got, you know, 
got school teachers in his family. He's got state troopers in his family. He's done incredible work with our state parks. I think Brett's the guy. And so I congratulate him and, uh, and you know, we'll be putting a press release out on that later on. But uh, congratulations, Brett, and go do it. You know, you got the ball, carry it, and I know you'll do great. I'm standing there ready to help in any way at all times. But I thank you so much, and that's all I got today. All right, thank you, Governor. For a special presentation, we're now going to hear from curator of the West Virginia Department of Arts, Culture, and History, Randall Reed Smith. Good morning, Governor. Oh, are we on? Good morning, Governor. Governor, there we go. We got to back down Randall's volume. Hold on, Randall. Wait just a second. We'll get you going here in a second. Good morning, Governor. Can you hear me? Voice, but now that one was a little loud, but now that you're good now. Okay, Governor. Uh, first of all, uh, this has been a great week for the arts, as you well know. Uh, Tuesday, we started with your statewide arts conference. We had 124 arts organizations here on uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. Tuesday night, we had your Governor's Awards for the Arts. That was just an incredible, incredible evening. Uh, yesterday was Arts Day uh, at the Capitol, and we had the halls filled with artists. And thank you for that arts proclamation that you gave us. And yesterday at 2.30, uh, they started the West Virginia Music Educators Association's uh, statewide conference. And, you know, all state band, all state orchestra, all state choir. And they give away an award every year, and it's the President's Award for the West Virginia Music Educators Association. And lo and behold, Governor, they gave this award to you, and I wanted to tell you why. They, this is the first time in two years they've been able to get together to meet for their conference, and they wanted to say thank you. Uh, for all you have done to keep the arts going, not only in the state, but especially through arts education. Uh, they are very grateful for you stepping in. I don't know if you remember our conversation back in August of 2020 when you called and said, Randall, who said we can't have marching bands at the football games? And we straightened that out. We were the only state to have a live marching band competition in 2020 because, as you said to me, we're going to come out of this one day, and when we come out of it, we want to make sure we have everything. And so they appreciate all of your support for the arts. They loved the new Governor's Cup series we did this year for marching bands, and we were able to help support them in their programs and you got to present that that beautiful governor's cup to the winning band and they love that we're going to do this for show choirs this year but governor most of all they really do love you for your support of teachers uh, there's about a thousand kids down at the civic center today and the greatest thing was just to see them smiling enjoying their music and they we're hoping they would get to see you, and they especially wanted to see Baby Dog. But, Governor, you should have that award in there, and I'm very, very proud of you because you have been strengthening the arts for five years now. Every year we've gotten more funding for the arts. The arts grow. They're an economic engine. We're there to make sure that, uh, you know, we keep this rocket ship going. So congratulations, Governor, and I really appreciate you too. I just got this brought in to me just one second ago, and it's the presidential award, you know, in regard to, from, from the standpoint, it says, orchestrating success, and it's from the West Virginia Music Educators Associations in the Mountain State. So, uh, Randall, I, you know, I, I'm humbled, I'm thankful, I'm proud, I'm all those things because you know, I'm sure that you could have selected a lot of people that are way more deserving than I. But, but with all of that, I, I, I mean this from the bottom of my heart, and, I want, and you know it. But I, I do stand rock solid, you know, rock solid of, of, of where my feelings are toward the arts, our culture, our history, absolutely all the great things from our music right on down all the great things, I'm all in. Because I really believe, and I believed it way back when, you know, we were struggling as a state, you know, when I walked in this door, and, 
And one of the things that we felt like, well, we have to make cuts. Well, I really felt like, you know, the more people you cut, more things you cut, more people leave. And, and I kept thinking to myself, you know, the arts have been a likely place to maybe cut more. And at the end of the day, you know, when we lose our identity of who we are and, not, and we're not proud again of all of our heritage and all that we are, and the arts are so, so, so much of our soul. And when we lose that, what do we got? I mean, really and truly, when it really boils right down to it, then who are we? And so it's been a real, real journey, and it's been, and it's been a lot of pride from my standpoint to be able to just stand back in the back and support and let you know that I'm with you, not only monetarily, but I'm with you with all my soul. And with all of that, you've taken off, and my gracious, you talk about somebody that is the curator of curators of curators. I mean, this man is stuck on on, and what a job he's done. It is unbelievable. And I, I've, just, uh, I've just stepped back in the boat with the rudder a little bit and helped a little bit now and then. Your award you've given me is, like I said, there's surely bunches of people that deserve it way more than I, but, uh, but I'll cherish it and I'll keep it forever. And I thank you, and, and I mean it from the bottom of my heart. You know, you, don't have, you won't ever, ever have to question where I stand. I stand for us being proud of us. That's all there is to it. And really, at the end of the day, I just think the more proud we are of us, the better things will be in West Virginia. And so these people, the, all the different people all across our arts and everything they do is phenomenal. If you'll just absolutely just, you know, just get knowledgeable of it. And not only that, right behind all that, not only what they do is incredible, but it is economically so great for West Virginia, it's off the chart. Every dollar we spend on the arts, every dollar, the multiplier effect of those dollars coming back in are instant, instant. And literally, it is just unbelievable. And I don't know if that multiplier is, is 14 or 20 times, but my goodness gracious, it is absolutely just terrific. So, so no, I'm all in. I'm all in. Congratulations to all those folks out there, and I, I love them with all my soul. And, and I don't know if I can run down and see anybody or not, but I do have baby dog here today, so that's good. <laughs> Governor, uh, if you do want to come down, I'll be down there. We're getting ready to do a class on arts advocacy, and there are about 1,000 kids that would love to see you and say thank you for your support of what they do and what's important to them. And, Governor, I don't know if this is, you know, really important, but you might want to know you're the only governor to ever get an award from the West Virginia Music Educator Association, and that was the teachers who decided this. And I, I just, I can't thank you enough, Governor. You, you rock. You're the best. <laughs> Okay, okay. All right, we'll see you, big guy. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. We'll now go to retired Major General Jim Hoyer, the director of our Joint Interagency Task Force. Good morning. Uh, just to highlight a few things, reinforce what the governor's talked about. We continue to trend uh, in uh, the, the right direction, but we still have more work to do. Some of the things that we have seen is we are now starting to see of the 31 locations that receive uh, uh, antibodies to administer, 16 of those have now uh, requested less antibodies as they're seeing less need for that. However, we are going to continue to expand the locations where both antibodies and antivirals uh, can be made available. I wanna thank Dr. Krista Capehart from uh, State Pharmacy Board, as well as uh, Sherry Farrell from Primary Care Association to continue to help expand that so that if we do need it in the future, we will have uh, broader places for individuals to receive that uh, treatment. As the governor pointed out, we hit an important milestone with 71.5% of those over 18 receiving a first shot, and we continue to see slow but steady progress in boosters uh, for those over age 50. 
Uh, we will be working and uh, completing uh, next week a, a calculator that can be used by individuals to understand uh, the need for boosters and when they need a booster shot uh, so that we can make it easier to continue to help people to understand around the confusion the need to get that booster shot as the governor has pointed out. Uh, as pointed out, hospital numbers continue to trend in the right direction. Uh, haven't gotten the exact number, but I believe it was uh, last late, late late July or early August last year that we would have been below 450 uh, in the hospital. And today we only had 39 new admissions for COVID. So continuing to move in the right direction. Uh, Governor, I, I, I wouldn't have imagined two years ago when we had our first meeting and they were telling us we might have 64 uh, fatalities from this that we would be talking about a hundred times more of that. But as you pointed out, uh, the work that's been done has saved a number of West Virginians from terrible, terrible fate, uh, and has helped a number of West Virginians recover. Uh, and I want to personally, uh, uh, from me and from my family, uh, thank you for your leadership, the opportunity to continue to work with you as we have since 2016 and the flood. Uh, but also, I, I think most important, uh, I've seen you throughout from 2016 to uh, today through this. Uh, the, more than your leadership, uh, I greatly appreciate the way you care about each individual West Virginian. So I thank you for that. And, uh, we will continue to press forward to to get beyond this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, we'll hear from Secretary Bill. Next, we'll hear from Secretary Bill Crouch with the DHHR. Uh, thank you, Jordan. I, I want to echo what uh, General Hoyer said, Governor. It's uh, it's been a long two years. Uh, it's been. Uh, it's been brutal. It's been tough on uh, on the staff of uh, DHHR and and the guard and others. And uh, you've helped us through that. And, and your leadership has just been phenomenal in terms of uh, striking that balance. So uh, so I, I thank you as well. Um, have, we've had several inquiries with regard to uh, yesterday's dashboard. So I want to want to talk about that just a second. Uh, we had a delay yesterday. The dashboard did not come up until late afternoon. Uh, we were able to get a press release out on that, but because of uh, technical difficulties, uh, again, that uh, that dashboard did not get up on time. Uh, there are multiple jobs that process throughout the night. Uh, those jobs have to all be successful to produce files to, to make the dashboard active in the morning. Uh, those jobs were not successful uh, night before last due to uh, network timeouts and connectivity issues. Uh, so those are out of our control and we apologize for the delay. Uh, sometimes I'm amazed that, uh, that it works as well as it does with all the moving pieces trying to get data from each uh, county in West Virginia up and onto the dashboard by 10 a.m. So I want to thank our folks for staying on top of that and, uh, and getting those uh, issues resolved and getting that data up. So as always, we want to be transparent. We want to provide the best information we can uh, to the public and to everyone in terms of uh, how we're doing with this pandemic. But uh, thank goodness uh, we're on the on the downslope now. So, so thank you all. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you, Secretary. Dr. Anam Jad is also joining us today and is available for questions. Dr. Clay Marsh had a prior engagement and will rejoin us next week. We'll now go to questions from members of the media. The first today from Kenny Bass with WCHS and Fox 11. Hi, thanks for taking a, a moment for the question. Two quick questions, one for the governor. Uh, your reaction to the DEP's report yesterday that uh, their initial air quality sampling of uh, ethylene oxide in the valley and that their um, uh, neutral site was less than one part per billion. Uh, they plan on doing three more samplings, but uh, it appears that the ethylene oxide um, sampling went well. And um, secondly, I'd like to ask you, governor, about opportunities, even though it's a terrible situation, opportunities possibly for West Virginia coal coming out of the Russian-Ukraine conflict. I know that the Coal Association says the state has received many calls from European countries who are a little nervous about their Russian supplies of um, coal, which are obviously important 
to those economies. And uh, just want to get your thoughts about those two things, sir. Well, first of all, Kenny, you know, from the DEP, uh, you know, on the first uh, first round monitoring, you know, it looks it looks good. It looks very favorable, and 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 we're happy about that and everything. But we still got was it's it's really too, too, still too early to 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 say we're across the finish line, and uh, and you know, this is somewhat raw data and everything, and so I, I'm not going to. I, I'm really not going to comment a whole lot more on that. I, I just really do believe that these, uh, the people at the DEP under the command of Harold Ward are doing good stuff, and, and they want really good stuff for all of us, and they're going to keep doing that. And, uh, and, and I'm, uh, you know, we don't need to be alarmists running through the theaters or running through the streets screaming fire, fire, fire. I mean, that was uh, not very smart. And uh, in fact, it, it, and, and we all know why. We all know why just trying to, trying to make a name, trying to be a somebody and everything else. And, and really, uh, you know, I, I just can't get into all that. I mean, I just, I just, I'm just not a fan of that at all. You know, from a standpoint, Kenny, of, uh, of what's happening with coal pricing, I mean, really what, what happened really day before yesterday is, is uh, steam coal. Not now. This is you know this is coal to make electricity. This is thermal coal. You know historically those prices have been probably in the in the range of thirty five to fifty five dollars a ton. And uh, you know I, I go back to this. I go back to this for crying out loud. You know, and I, I I've I've said it a bunch of times, but we should have tiered the severance tax. We should have tiered the severance tax. You know, and helped our companies. You know, when things were tough. And really, you know, ask them to step up and throw a little bit more in the collection plate when things were exceptionally good, you know, on coal, oil, and gas. And, and, I, and, and my family's been right in the coal business forever and, and really and truly. So I'm stepping up saying, you know, when things really are good, we ought to throw more money in the collection plate because these natural resources are West Virginia's natural resources. I know they're privately held and they're privately owned. I get all that. But this part of our soul, you know, and uh, and and I don't, you know, I mean these these great companies have done everything, everything for West Virginia in so many different ways, and I'm not trying to, you know, take anything back from them in every in any way, and I, I guess it's a super dead issue, and we all know that and everything, but at the same time, from just a standpoint of not, you know, I mean, there's so much of the world. That now believes, you know, just doesn't matter if right and wrong. It just matters what we can get by with and everything. And 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 these companies have done unbelievably good stuff. That's all there is to it. But my whole thought was, when things got incredibly good, West Virginia would benefit a little bit better. And when things got really tough, West Virginia would step up and help those companies because of all the great jobs that they you know, provide to all the people, and there is nothing better than a coal mine job because the multi multiplier effect of that job is enormous in what it brings to the state of West Virginia. I've said all along, we don't want to forget coal. Absolutely, to just shove coal into the background and act like it's a bad word and everything, are you kidding me? And to be frivolous enough to believe that we can just because we want to say it, we can just automatically think that windmills or whatever it may be, you know, solar panels, whatever it may be, are absolutely going to just take over and they are going to be our salvation tomorrow. Well, we want to embrace all the, in, all the alternatives, don't, don't we? All the alternatives. And I hate this is going on, but I just want you to just listen to me. I am an all-encompassing energy guy. Because I really believe that it is frivolous to think that today, and I've said it a million times, that these alternatives can, can control the day today. They can't. There's no way they can. And so with all that, unless we want to get awfully hot and awfully cold and everything, unless we're willing to accept that, if we want to have our lights on and be able to do live life how, how, how we're living life, 
then we've got to just step up to the plate and recognize that our fossil fuels are going to be here for a while. And they may be here for a long while. We may very well be able to come up with technologies that provide the ability to have them here forever. But with all of that, we've got to live here too. And if we're going to live here too, then we have to have our fossil fuels today. Now, with that, here's what I would say. Remember when I just said a minute ago that a typical steam coal price is probably $35 to $60 a ton. Now, we, we have benefited in West Virginia because the steam coal has risen to around $100 a ton, $75 to $105 or whatever dollars a ton. With what just has happened and everything, day before yesterday, steam coal, thermal coal, delivered to Europe and everything, reached, uh, now this is, this is a metric ton delivered to the port in, in, you know, at Newport News or wherever it may be, delivered to one of our ports, and then the ocean freight paid and delivered to Rotterdam. The price went to $450 a ton day before yesterday. Now, last night it dropped $100, and it's going to be very, very, very radical type swings. I would just tell you just this. We don't need to be hogs. Absolutely, we don't need to be that in any way. But there is opportunity within our state for goodness from the standpoint of helping our coal companies our miners in every way, and, and so many multiplier effects of those dollars, and that's good. That's good. You know, from the standpoint of this terrible tragedy that's happening in Ukraine right now, would we all in West Virginia be big enough to say, no, gosh, we, we wish that wouldn't happen. I am at the top of that list. It is tragic what is happening to those people, and it's wrong beyond belief. And the leadership of this country is so misguided right now, I, it, 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 it just blows me away. It blows me flat away. Now you think about this just a second. Here you've got a guy in Putin in the Soviet Union that is threatening nuclear war. That's what he's doing. And not only is he threatening, but he's absolutely just mowing down people in Ukraine right now. And there's babies dying, there's young kids dying, there's women dying, there's absolute bombing going on that is nowhere close to military targets. It's absolutely directed directly towards civilians. And on and on and on. And now, on top of that, we had an attack on a nuclear, uh, uh, one of the nuclear, gigantic nuclear plant you know, that absolutely could cause catastrophic things all across Europe. Now just think about it. Think about it. What are we going to do? What are we going to combat him with? And I don't have it written down here, but just imagine, you know, and, and you know, I go back to this. A lot of you will know this, but in one of the Peter Sellers movies 500 years ago almost, you know, one of the Pink Panther movies. Yeah, you know, there was a fight that broke out, broke out by the pool. And, and all of a sudden, Peter Sellers is standing there and he holds up his badge like that. And like, like that's going to stop this guy from just drilling him between the eyes. Well, he, when he did that and everything, and now Peter Sellers was a real comedian and everything. And when he did that, the guy just wham and hit him right between the eyes. Now, literally, this, in this situation today, not being a comedian at all, but I just think, think, energy, we have weaponized energy. Energy, I have said it over and over, civilization only progresses with abundant chief energy. Energy is everything to us. And with all of that, what, we, what, what are we going to do? Putin is standing there with a tank. The tank's loaded, ready to go. And absolutely, he has directed these people to mow people down. And Putin is standing in the background saying that he may very well, he may very well launch a nuclear attack 
and we're going to run up to him and say, what about our windmills? It ain't going to work, is it? It's not going to work. Now, with all that, you know, Kenny, uh, I don't think any West Virginians want to be hogs. And, and at the end of the day, uh, unfortunately, in this world, with, with every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And in these actions today, the reaction is people are seeking and really needing our coal. And from that standpoint, I'm happy we're going to have more coal miners work. We're going to have more coal miners with higher wages. And we're going to have more goodness and stability with our companies in West Virginia. And absolutely, we should always be proud of our contribution of our natural resources. Those natural resources right now may prevent a lot of people from dying, a lot of people from being really, really cold. And absolutely, they may absolutely prevent a catastrophe beyond belief, a nuclear war of some kind. You know, it just, uh, you know, Kenny, that, uh, that's, you know, thing about with every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And we can be beneficiaries of that in West Virginia. But absolutely, I know in West Virginia, all the West Virginia people would stand very tall and say, you know, we would gladly give that up in, in a second, gladly give that up in a second if some way, somehow, this thing could stop and the Ukrainian people could be free and, and, and live as we live. So with all of that, plenty enough goodness going on that people are in, that our natural resources are in demand in the steel side and the thermal side all across the globe. And really and true, we don't need this situation in, in Ukraine right now. Sad. It's really, really sad. All right. Thank you, Kenny. Next, we'll go to Charles Young with WV News. Hi, y'all. This is Charles Young with WV News. Um, Governor, could you comment on your plans for the future of these briefings with, you know, everything improving, everything trending in the right way? Do you still think it's necessary to do these three times a week? Are we going to be cutting that down going forward? Thank you. Charles, I hope we'll squeeze that down. I mean, you know, really and truly, uh, I think it's been it's been really good, you know, from the standpoint that uh, people across our state, you know, hear from the governor. They the governor will answer any question that comes up, uh, you know, and and so so uh, you know, it's I think it's really inform real informative and uh, to the people. But at the same time, uh, you know, Charles, we we surely got plenty to do rather than just do briefings. And so it, but uh, but. You know, we'll we'll squeeze it down, and uh, and hopefully, wouldn't it be really great to just uh, do some kind of governor address every couple of weeks or something like that, and uh, and be done with this. But uh, you know, by done with this, what I'm I'm saying is not done necessarily with the briefings, but I'm just saying that be done with this terrible pandemic that has haunted us now for two years plus. All right, thank you, Charles. Governor, I will turn it back to you to close out. Uh, well, I, you know, I, I, again, I want to thank, you know, Randall Reed Smith, our curator of the arts and all the great stuff that he does in every way. I want to thank the people that were kind enough to give me this award and everything. It's, uh, you know, it's greatly appreciated. And, and I'm sure, like I said, many, many, many folks out there are probably way more deserving than I. But, uh, but with that, you know, I, I, I'd, I'd like to congratulate Brett McMillian. I'm sure Brett will, you know, he'll be the leader of the band for our DNR and all the great stuff that they do. And my goodness, do they do wonderful stuff and everything. And so, so all that will be really good, too. And, uh, and one thing that wasn't in my notes today is to thank the National Guard, to thank the National Guard for all the work they do. You know, I, I just, uh, you know, I go back to, I guess my first real indoctrination of just how good they really were was back in the flood of 2016. You know, and, and I was amazed, amazed. You know, there we were in the 
mud and the nasty stuff and everything and just and people heartbroken all over the place and and displaced and every it just it was it was really it was the worst thing I guess maybe that I had ever been through especially at that time now with that I saw them just rise to the top beyond belief and then along the way now I and then I became governor and I've had the opportunity to deal with them over and over on countless, countless things. They're always stepping up. They always do everything. I've known all my life, and I've believed it with all my soul, that we owe everything we have to our military. But I'm telling you, the National Guard not only protects us, and is not only there to absolutely take care of us in every way, they absolutely do just exactly that many many duties that don't have anything to do with you know fighting on the front lines you know so i you know it wasn't in my notes i want to be sure and thank them and uh and i want to tell you this don't forget those coal miners you know at the end of the day if you don't really have an appreciation for our coal miners you're not much of a frog in that situation either i mean those people especially those folks, you know, that are, that are underground, you know, that are doing the great work there, and our surface mine folks as well, because they're running high-tech equipment, and sometimes it's really risky, the different things that they do. They come to work every single day. Our deep miners in many, many situations and on our metallurgical seams, they may not be any higher than 30-inch coal. So they're in a deep mine, thousands of feet underground, and really, truly, in a lot of situations, can't even sit up all day. You know, they're, they're, they're in that deep mine with the top and the earth cracking and making noises all the time. There could very well be situations where they're going under a stream or something like that that's hundreds and hundreds of feet above them and the water just pouring in. There's many days that, honest and true, they come to work in chest waders and rain suits. You know, there's many days that other equipment is running right beside them and the piece of the noise and everything that's going on and they come out of the mines completely black-faced and everything with coal dust. They powered this nation. They gave us the steel that absolutely protects us and builds things every day. If you don't have a real love for our coal miners and a real respect for them and absolutely want every single one of them to get home to their families every night from the standpoint of safety, then you got to screw loose in my book. That's all there is to it. These people are real stars. And so, so from the standpoint of... Uh, you know, the coal market being strong, our, our people back to work, and lots and lots and lots of opportunities and everything, I surely applaud that. But at the same time, I will promise you there's enough demand all across this world that we do not need to be, you know, in any way supportive of what the Russians are doing. We'll all trade it in a second. We'll all trade it in a second. If some way somehow the Ukrainian Ukrainian people could be could could be free and 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 left alone, and Russia could go back into being Russia, you know. But with all that being said, uh, there's plenty of demand elsewhere for our coals all across this globe. We don't need it to be in Ukraine, that's for sure. That's all I got. Constitution. Folks, I speak on behalf of many of my constituents in my district who believe that we are on the verge of a doomsday for our country right now. We have a federal debt approaching $30 trillion. We have a border, federal laws, federal laws that this federal government refuses to enforce, which are bringing millions of people into our country at taxpayers' expense, which will further add to that incredible debt that cannot last. 
So is doomsday going to happen tomorrow? I don't know. Will it happen next week? I have no clue. But my constituents want safeguards and guardrails in place. And the only way we can ever address what's happening in Washington, D.C. as a state is to assign delegates to get to this convention and have these discussions for we the people. Period. I urge adoption of this resolution. Thank you. Chairman of the 51st, Secretary Williams is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, and thanks to the delegate from the 67th for stealing a little bit of my thunder, but I'll try to make some uh, original points today. I want to talk a little bit, not so much about the, the process of the Constitutional Convention. I don't think that it is a, a terribly bad idea. I would regard it as a doomsday advice, but my concern with the convention is at this point in time in our country is, is now the time. The first convention was attended by uh, George Washington, James Madison, Benjamin Franklin, James Wilson, Alexander Hamilton. Who among us in political life rises to that level? Nobody's going to write a musical about anybody in political life in 200 years like they did Hamilton. There's no one as thoughtful and, and as bright, and I, I just fear that there are such fissures in our country right now, such divides that if we had a constitutional convention at this moment in time, you would get nothing but bad faith arguments based upon uninformed opinions. This is not the time. Maybe someday it would be the time, but now is not doomsday. The people in the first convention were brought together by a despotic king thousands of miles away who was taxing them without re representation, quartering troops in their houses. There is not a circumstance that rises to anything near that level at this point in time. This is, will turn into nothing more than a partisan runaway convention, the effects of which we might not be able to even fathom. I urge rejection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman of 55th, Doug Ward, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My friend from the 36 would have you believe that. Uh, this is going to be an exercise in secrecy uh, that we have no idea wh where this would go. Uh, let's take him at his word and, and just concede uh, that, you know, it, it, it rolls out the way that, that he's suggesting it would. Not a thing in this convention would pass were it not brought back to the states where there is no secrecy. Everything that we do is televised. Everything that we do is recorded. Three-fourths of the states would have to ratify anything that came out of this convention. My friend from the 67th uh, made a, a, a comment that uh, every amendment proposed by this application can be done now in the normal way. Who in this body suggests that the normal way is going to happen? Who thinks that the federal government, the Congress, is going to police itself? I was born in 1965, and at that time we had roughly $300 million in national debt. It's hard for me to be optimistic that my 17-year-old daughter will ever grow up in a country where we can proclaim that we're a strong, safe country, because uh, as it was mentioned by one of the delegates, uh, a, a, uh, almost 10 percent of what we spend now as taxpayers goes just to service the, the national debt. What happens when it becomes 20 or 30? I'm fired up. This is it, it terrifies me that we're on this path. I cannot predict what would happen in an Article 5 convention. And I know that folks that, that have looked to me as a representative of, of, of or, or been called a, a, a constitutional chair for, or a constitutional person that, that you know, takes pride in, in, in our Constitution. I'll never, and nobody in this room, as mentioned, uh, will ever have the uh, the statesmanship in the in the uh, you know the, the the gift from God to be able to predict you know how we as humans would be able to govern ourselves. 
But I do know that if we don't do something, the nirvana that you spoke of, though it's unachievable, will, will continue in the opposite direction until the states take the power that they have. I urge adoption of this amendment. Lady to 51st, Dr. Fleshauer is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I rise to urge rejection of this amendment um, for reasons, some of which have been spoken. Um, I, I'd like to remind everybody a little bit about history, um, and, and I had to look it up. Uh, the Articles of Convention were totally thrown out. That is the only, that is the only precedent we have. So many people have already stated that there is no um, right of anyone to control the rules of that convention. But after we adopted our Constitution, we adopted a number of amendments, including the First Amendment, and the Second Amendment, and the Third Amendment, and the first 10 amendments, which were called the Bill of Rights. And we used the process in the Constitution to adopt those amendments after the Constitutional Convention, at which the precedent, the only precedent we have was set that said that you can throw out everything that you had before. So there are no restraints. There are no limitations. And I'd like to read, um, and, and I am somebody who has studied the Constitution and who loves our Constitution. I think that is something that m most everyone in this room shares. And I just want to read something that was written um, by a, one of our Supreme Court justices who was given the opportunity to interpret the Constitution. Um, Chief Justice Warren Burger, who was appointed by Republican Richard Nixon, said, there is no way to effectively limit or muzzle the actions of a constitutional convention. The convention could make its own rules and set its own agenda. Congress might try to limit the convention to one amendment or one issue, but there is no way to assure that the convention would obey. After a convention is convened, it will be too late to stop the convention if we don't like its agenda. We don't know if they'll keep the three quarters rule. We don't know what will happen to interests of West Virginia. Uh, we are a small state and um, we could be affected in negative ways by the Constitutional Convention because we don't have the population. In fact, we are losing population as we speak. People are voting with their feet and leaving. So just because we do this doesn't mean that the issues that some of you believe in or that I believe in are going to get into that document. So I would recommend that we reject this, use our normal process. I remember when 18-year-olds were given the right to vote. That is a relatively recent amendment. Um, the amendment process can work and um, does work. And I think that it's, it's important that this document, which I consider sacred, that we take it very, very seriously if we're going to change it. So I recommend rejection of the resolution. Gentleman the third, Dr. Fluharty is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to channel my inner gentleman from the 32nd. Another. Article 5 resolution. Another Article 5 resolution. Year after year, people embark on this legislature, and I know they love the Constitution. They love the Constitution. So much so, they usually put on their ties as they walk around these halls. They love it. I mean, I don't know why we keep wasting such precious legislative time on this. Year after year, we get these speeches that say this is the most important vote. And then we vote on it the very next year. Uh, it's, I'm eager for this special meeting we may have. If you think this is just a meeting, I suppose you think January 6th was just a tourist event. Give me a break. We've never had an Article 5 convention. The closest we came was 1983. We were two states shy. What did Congress do that year? They went in, introduced 41 bills related to it. Many of those bills related to how the delegation would be selected and be based on population. So if you think West Virginia is going to have equal representation, good luck. Congress is going to dominate you. You're giving more power to Congress. You don't think they're going to get ready for this? Give me a break. You're not going to bypass Congress. You're simply asking them to call the convention. 
you know, uh, I don't get it, guys. I'm tired of the emails, so maybe we should just light this board green, send it on its way, and call it a day. That'd be great. But no, we'll be back again, and you know this. Let's just quit wasting this precious legislative time. Let's move on, get something done that actually helps West Virginians and not keep pushing this political fetish every year, every year that you guys love so much. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman, the 45th, Doug Martin's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move the previous question. Okay, the gentleman, the 45th, moves the previous question on the resolution. Is the demand for the previous question sustained? The demand is sustained. The question is, shall the previous question be ordered on the resolution? Those in favor of ordering the previous question on the resolution will say aye. Aye. Those opposed will say no. Roll call vote is demanded. Is demand sustained? Demand is sustained. The question is, shall the previous question on House Concurrent Resolution 31 be ordered? Those in favor of ordering the previous question on House Concurrent Resolution 31 will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no. The clerk will prepare the machine. <laughs> Has every member voted? If so, the clerk will close the machine and ascertain the result on this question. There are 22 ayes, 72 nays, and six members absent. Less than a majority in the affirmative. The chair declares the motion for the previous question rejected. The previous question is not ordered. Gentleman 32nd, Doug at Fast is recognized on the resolution. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not exactly sure what the previous speaker was referring to, but it's been implied and actually explicitly stated that um, in such a convention, an Article 5 convention, that it could nullify the entire Constitution. Do you think, ladies and gentlemen, that if that were the product of such a convention that 38 states would actually vote to ratify such a decision by a convention? No way. No way. Nevertheless, <clears throat> speaking of the document that is now before us, this Article 30, this uh, Resolution 31, number one, impose physical restraints on the federal government. Number two, limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government. Number three, limit the terms of office for its officials and for members of Congress. Very, very specific. In addition, a lot of discussion has taken place regarding the Bill of Rights. What does this resolution say specifically? An amendment that in any way seeks to amend, modify, or repeal any provision of the Bill of Rights shall not be authorized for consideration at any stage. This, applica this application shall be void ab initio. That means void from the beginning. If it ever used at any stage to consider any change to the provision of the Bill of Rights. In addition, safeguards. It's been stated that there are no safeguards. That is absolutely false. Just read the document. Number seven, the West Virginia legislature may provide further instruction to its delegates and may recall its delegates at any time for a breach of a duty or a violation of the instructions. Any time. That's us, ladies and gentlemen. The legislature has the power at any time to recall its delegates. That means they're not participating anymore. So ladies and gentlemen, you know, the Constitution that I believe we all agree is a sacred document and a good document. But you know what's in that document? Article 5. The wisdom of the founders who created this document that we all say is grand and got us here this far, the wisdom was to put in it Article 5. And folks, desperate times call for desperate measures. It's been mentioned 
nearing $30 trillion in debt. We are on a path of unsustainability. We are on a path of unsustainability. If we want this republic to last, it calls for desperate measures. And I agree, this is a desperate measure, and it's not something you want to do every other year. And we've not done it since the beginning of this country. But here we are, if we want this country to ever survive, this is a desperate measure that I believe we have to take. We have to do this. I would urge passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. June the 50th, I got Garcia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Very briefly, I just find it ironic, but not surprising, that the gentleman from the 45th and those 22 other members who voted to squash debate appear to be the most ardent supporters of this convention. I think that tells you all you need to know. Thank you. The gentleman the second, Doug DeSerio is recognized. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my vote did not register when the question was called on the last vote, and I uh, voted in the red. Yes, the Chair will ask the clerk to record the gentleman's vote as having voted in the negative on the question. Thank you. The gentleman 37, Doug Pushkin is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the uh, gentleman from the 36 who's in support of this resolution please yield? Yes. Thank you. I'm reading the resolution in, in, in the whereas uh, section, uh, giving the reasons why we would be doing something like this. On uh, line 8, whereas the concentration of power at the federal level has had the effect of making federal officials less responsive to the will of the people, well, I agree with that. And more readily influenced by lobbyists, I agree with that. And wealthy corporations, I agree with that. And special interests in Washington, D.C., I agree with that as well. How would this alleviate that problem? How would that address the issue of the money's influence on politics? Okay, this is how it works with regulations. What typically happens with regulations is that um, the federal government is completely um, uncontrolled in terms of how a statute is generally operates. So let's say you take any general statute that's, that's applicable. What typically happens is that statute, for example, let's say the EPA, it's so broadly worded and there is, it's structured in such a way such that it's, there's basically no limits. For example, the Environmental Protection Agency, right now West Virginia is arguing in the United States Supreme Court about excessive authority that has been taken by the executive branch of government. So what happens is, whenever these regulations come out, these individuals will, will uh, be, um, will, will, they hire their, their special interests, they hire the lobbyists on, and they, tr they make the case to the federal government. So for example, I'll, I'll, use, I'll, I'll just take this. The Obama administration comes in, after the Obama administration comes in, they, they use a statute to greatly expand the power and authority of the federal government. Now, that federal government, that, they're, they're interpreting and applying the law in a way that was never intended. It was never intended to be applied that way. But the special interests, they help elect individuals into the federal government who control the presidency, and at that point they change the regulations. What this does, if we take away the ability of the federal government to have this, this broad sweeping power in terms of how they interpret regulations, we limit that. We limit their ability to do that. So that's what happens here. The federal government, uh, through the executive, is beholden to the special interests, and they're not accountable to the people. The people are represented through Congress. What would keep, that didn't answer the question. Uh, I appreciate the. Well, yes, it did. No, well, <laughs> what would keep money from influencing this whole process to begin with? Oh, are you talking about? My, I don't think I understand the question. Okay. Well, thank you for yielding. I'll explain. Thanks for yielding. Um, well, I agree with a lot of the findings in this, a lot of the reasons uh, for it. And I think one of the, the biggest reasons is right there, that there is, the, the problem we have was with money's influence on politics, and none of this will address that. 
None of this will address, unless it was just to overturn Citizens United, but that's not what we're talking about here. Um, but I guess it could. It could overturn Citizens United, but I don't think that that's what you're going to have with the, the money that goes into influencing the folks who would be uh, sent to the convention, that would be used to influence uh, the states once it's brought back to ratify. The problem is just the, the, the amount of money that is spent on, on influencing decisions that are made here, on, influ on, on decisions that are made on the other side of the build building, and in the, the huge amounts of money that are used to influence uh, decisions on a congressional level. None of this will address that, and I know that because most of the money I've seen spent in this state has been spent to get us to vote for this. If you look up the, the reports, the expenditure reports on groups like U.S. term limits and other Article 5 groups, they spend more than anybody else. In, in some of our races. They have so much money. They spent money to sending out postcards in my district when I was on a post. That's stupid money. <laughs> stupid money. That's how much they spend. Fly people all around the country. Fly the, the CEO of Parler around the different state legislatures to testify on this. Why is there so much money involved in this? Because that's who's going to have the influence if this horrible idea ever comes to fruition. I would just hope that the rest of the states that haven't ratified this are a little more sensible than we're about to be. Question again is on the adoption of House Concurrent Resolution 31. Are there other members who wish to speak on the resolution? Chairman 36, Dr. Rose, recognized for a second recognition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I tried to take notes on some of the comments, and I, I, I truly appreciate how deeply people feel about this and how concerned they are. I, it, 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 I, I certainly have the same feelings and concerns. I, I just, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I just can't imagine challenging the Constitution in this way, and, and it's, 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 it's something I've lived with. I'm an attorney. Uh, it's something that uh, I'm so happy to live in the United States of America and not in other countries where they just can't get the rule of law right. In regard to debt, I would say this. I, I'm also concerned there, but please know that Bill Clinton balanced the budget. And so when we say that this structure of government cannot possibly balance the budget, Bill Clinton did it at a time when we thought it could not be done. So, so it can be done, and it's going to take some, some work to do. Uh, uh, I would point out that one of the largest congressional grants is the infrastructure bill. I, I haven't talked to anybody that's not really excited about it, and, I, and it was bipartisan as far as I know. Uh, the, uh, in terms of rules of the convention, that's the scary part, folks. It can be, it can be in secret. And, uh, and also, uh, the, the Congress cannot tell the convention that they have to propose separate amendments to be ratified. A single amendment, amendment one, or the amendment, and then just put it all into one, and you either ratify it and take what you get. That's, Congress is specifically not allowed to create rules regarding amendments. Uh, I think it even uses the term amendment convention. Not amendments, but amendment. And you go, well, do these, these little things matter? It matters a lot because the folks who are proposing this have, uh, have the money and the resources to do exactly what they want done. And I think it's frightening. Bill of Rights. Now, the, understand that the Bill of Rights in the Constitution are the first ten amendments. They are not applied, they were considered by the court before the Civil War to not apply to the states. So your, your freedom of re religion did not apply to the state and the state could do what it thought was appropriate. The, it's the 14th Amendment that applied the Bill of Rights to the states universally, so that the primacy, the federal power, what's the terminology they use? That the power and jurisdiction of the federal government in regard to those amendments is primary. So if, if somebody wants to, in the, in the uh, con amendment convention, wants to do something with one of the Bill of Rights, they're not able to do it directly. They can do it through changing the 14th Amendment that applies those Bill of Rights to the states. Uh, 
it, we, were, uh, we were, were considered uh, Supreme Court justices, term limits for Supreme Court justices. Now, that's a dramatic change, and, and when, anytime I'm feeling like I'm, I'm on the low-end min minority part of the Supreme Court, I think, hmm, term limits, well, uh, how long are they going to serve? The problem with that is that it limits their independence. And that is part of the genius of the, the, of the Constitution, is to have three separate branches of government and make the Supreme Court judges and all federal judges lifetime appointments. And we get some folks that we're not crazy about on their decisions. But on the whole, I challenge you to find a, a better system for independence of a ju judiciary anywhere in the world. So term limits for Supreme Court justices. The ratification process, uh, uh, can be either to this legislature or to a special convention called for the purpose of ratification. So nobody in this room necessarily would be called upon to approve this, this amendment convention and any of the work that it's done. Uh, it, Congress gets to pick legislatures or convention, and the resolution asks that it be done by legislative uh, enactment. The, uh, we were talked about, we talked about safeguards. There just aren't any safeguards in this when you, when you put it in the context of the constitutional law. There's no safeguard about secrecy. There's no safeguard about one amendment versus multiple amendments. Uh, the document has, it's been said that it's a sacred and good document. Folks, the Constitution of the United States is more than a document. It is 200 and some years of interpretations of that document. And I stand by those. And I think the flexibility that the founders put in the Constitution is the secret of its success for over 200 years. It's not a document. It is who we are. It is the life we live. It is the law we respect. That's what the Constitution is. And I, the thing that really, kind of, the question that comes to my mind is, is we're basically going to set up a structure just like Congress's. We call Congress a swamp. Tell me why we're not going to have a swamp deciding what our Constitution looks like. In sweeping ways. I mean, the entire fabric of the country can be amended in the amendment convention. Single amendment. Take what you can get. I think that whenever we look at, at who we are, where we are, uh, you know, I, you have to say uh, we have the, the most powerful economy in the world based upon the Commerce Clause of the United States Constitution and the way it's been interpreted over the years. Uh, our economy today is the strongest economy in the world, even with that debt. Uh, I, I think that whenever we balance rule of law and who we are and tradition and, and how we kind of work through things, versus a sweeping power of this body to just rewrite everything, including the, uh, the structure of government, it's frightening. I mean, one of the things that the safeguards for this body is that our votes on bills and resolutions are according to establishing policy. We are not allowed to change the structure of state government. We have to propose an amendment to, this, to the people in order to do that. And that's what ought to happen. So in, uh, the, if the safeguards are not in place, it's a dangerous, dangerous uh, attack on the foundation of our government and our society. And I urge the members to vote against this resolution. The question again is on the adoption of House Concurrent Resolution 31. Chairman 36, Doug at Pritt for a second recognition. Yes. I'll be brief. We do love the Constitution, those of us who are supporting this resolution. What we don't love is Roe v. Wade, Wickard v. Foburn, and many other decisions that have abused the Constitution. This is our way to stand up to the Washington politicians and judges. I urge adoption of the resolution. Chairman the 16th, Ticket Hornbuckle. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I will be brief as well. I have listened to good debate here on this House floor. There's been a lot of things that have been said. But yet again, this majority legislature has left me completely flummoxed. Completely flummoxed. And I will point out the statement that has stuck with me the most. The gentleman from the 32nd has stated he does not believe 
that there would be 38 to ratify. He does not believe there will be 38 to ratify. Well, I would argue if that is the case, then why are we voting for this? If you do not believe that it would have the 38 it requires to ratify. Something smells here. It's clearly obvious. Vote this down. Thank you. Question is on the adoption of House Concurrent Resolution 31. Is there further debate on the resolution? If not, the question before the House is, shall the resolution be adopted? Those in favor of adoption of the resolution will say aye. Aye. Roll call vote is demanded. Is the demand sustained? Demand is sustained. The question is, shall the resolution be adopted? Those in favor of adoption of the resolution will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no. The clerk will prepare the machine. <coughs> Has every member voted? If so, the clerk will close the machine, ascertain the result on this question. There are 77 ayes, 19 nays, and four members absent. A majority of members voting in the affirmative. The chair declares that resolution adopted. The clerk will please communicate the action of the House to the Senate. Is there further unfinished business? If not, bills on third reading. Senate Bill 448, Developing Policies and Procedures for Statewide Interoperability Executive Committee. Are there objections to having this bill explained in lieu of having it read? If not, gentlemen, seven or 16, Doug Linville to explain the bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Senate Bill 448 is uh, identical to uh, S uh, House Bill 4370. Actually, uh, pause, Mr. Speaker. I believe there's an amendment pending in the system. Does the gentleman wish to explain the bill prior to considering the amendments or consider the amendments first? Uh, the amendment first, if we could. Okay. Are there objections to having the amendment explained in lieu of having it read? Okay, if not, gentlemen, 16, to explain the amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, uh, the amendment is uh, very much like that which was adopted in the Finance Committee on House Bill 4370. Again, this is companion legislation to House Bill 4370. It simply clarifies that nothing in this bill would contradict the Vertical Real Estate Management Act, which was a part of the broadband bill from roughly two years ago. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, in relation to that, and I would urge the amendment's adoption. The question before the House is the amendment explained just now by the gentleman 16th, Doug at Linville. Is there debate on the amendment? If not, the question is, shall the amendment be adopted? Those in favor of adoption of the amendment will please say aye. aye. As opposed to please say no. If the ayes have a chair declares that amendment adopted, are there further amendments to the bill? Okay, if not, the clerk will read the bill a third time as amended. Senate Bill 448, developing policies and procedures for statewide interoperability executive committee. Chairman the 16th, to explain the bill as amended. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, Senate Bill 448 is companion legislation to House Bill 4370. Uh, this bill would amend the provisions of the West Virginia Code relating to the statewide interoperable radio network, also known as the SIREN network. The bill would make the following substantive changes. It would authorize the SIREN Executive Committee to revoke, suspend, or modify any entity's use of the SIREN network or its equipment. It would provide guidance and services to support the proper cleansing of decommissioned radios previously connected to the SIREN network and develop a recycling program for two-way radios uh, and telecommunications equipment of state agencies, um, except for agencies that are handled by the Office of Technology, for redistribution, reuse, or sale once properly cleansed. And it directs that any monies received from the sale of recycled two-way telecommunications equipment be deposited in the statewide interoperable radio network account. That is the bill, Mr. Speaker. I'm, ha I'm happy to answer any questions, and I do urge passage. The question before the House is, shall the bill pass? Chairman of the 53rd, Delegate Jennings is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, I have a couple of questions. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering about our fire departments and EMS squads that are also use these uh, radios. Will this affect them in any way? Uh, no, to the gentleman. Um, so it, it, potentially the state could provide guidance to them on how to uh, support the proper cleansing of radios as they decommission them. So it would just be they could issue them guidance. Um, but as it, as it relates to the recycling program for two-way telecommunications equipment, as a for instance, um, that only is applicable to state agencies. So a county agency, a private agency, a volunteer fire department, any of those things are not implicated in this bill. Okay, and you said that they, they would, something different is they will be able to tell the different agencies who can be on it and who can't be on it? 
So that, that generally relates to the towers themselves and equipment that would be placed upon the towers. Um, but yes, it does allow the, the Siren Executive Committee uh, to revoke, suspend, or modify any entity's use of the Siren network or, or specifically equipment belonging to the Siren network. Okay, some of their towers is on other, other uh, people's, uh, some of their equipment's on other people's towers. How will that affect that? I don't believe that would affect uh, you know, equipment that's on other towers whatsoever. Um, council could, could correct me if I'm wrong about that, but I do know that they have, uh, they co-locate on uh, public broadcasting towers, those sorts of things. Um, it would not affect that, except in, in, the, in the instance where there was some connection to their equipment as a, as a, as a for instance. So, um, but placing it on a public broadcasting tower or even a county 911 owned tower, something like that, uh, is generally not implicated here, no. Okay, thank you. Chairman 36, Dr. Rose recognized. Could I ask a few questions? I, sure. As, as I understand it, the idea of this is to, is to get the radios, make radios recyclable. They can be reprogrammed and then reused and, and distributed as appropriate by Homeland Security. Is that ballpark? I'm, I'm not completely sure how we're acting here. So I think the, the purpose of the bill um, is, is related to the security of the network. Okay, and so they want to make sure that anyone who's using equipment that that directly connects to the network, uh, to the to this emergency network uh, that is statewide, that you know they're able to say, you know, look, there's not going to be someone operating incorrectly on our network. There's not going to be something that would harm the utilization of the network. And then, as radios, as a for instance, so that's what everyone thinks of, as these radios are decommissioned or someone wants to replace them, um, you know, they want to make sure that any sensitive data. Um, programming, those sorts of things that are on there, specifically, again, to, that, are, that are owned by state agencies, we can force it. Uh, those that are owned by, by you know, a local agency, a, a, you know, a, a volunteer fire department, as a for instance, they can provide guidance on how to securely wipe the information off of, off of those, uh, those equipments. But again, it has no, it, it, um, it's primarily security and then the ability to reuse them. I mean, if you're not uh, correctly wiping them, we certainly would not want um, you know, that to you know, go, to, go to somebody else to be able to actively participate in SIREN. But this is something that Homeland Security wants? Yes, that is correct. Thank you, sir. Question again, shall the bill pass? Is there further debate on the bill? If not, those in favor of passage of the bill will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no. The clerk will prepare the machine. Has every member voted? If so, the clerk will close the machine and ascertain the result on this question. There are 95 ayes, one nay, and four members absent. Majority of members voting in the affirmative. The chair declares that bill passed. The clerk will please support the title. Senate Bill 448, Developing Policies and Procedures for Statewide Interoperability Executive Committee. Are there amendments to the title? Delegate Summers moves to amend the title. The question before the House now is the adoption of the title amendment. Those in favor of adoption of the title amendment will please say aye. Suppose to please say no. The ayes have it. The chair declares the title of the amendment adopted. The title as amended by the House will be and remain the title of the bill. The clerk will please communicate the action of the House to the Senate. Next bill on third reading. Committee substitute for Senate Bill 520, increasing financial penalties for ransomware attacks. Are there objections to having this bill explained in lieu of having read? If not, the gentleman of the 35th Doug Capito to explain the bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The committee substitute for Senate Bill 520 amends 61-3C-8, disruption of computer services. The current version of this section makes it a misdemeanor for knowingly and willfully disrupting or degrading computer services without authorization. This misdemeanor carries a sentence of up to a year in jail and a fine of $200 to $1,000 or both jail time and a fine. The bill keeps that misdemeanor and it adds subsection B that creates a felony for knowingly and willfully disrupting or degrading or threatening to dis disrupt or degrade computer services, this is the operative language, with the intent to obtain money or any other thing of value. Perhaps the most well-known version of this crime would be ransomware. A person convicted of this felony could either be fined not more than a million dollars, imprisoned for not more than 20 years, or could be both fined and imprisoned. Mr. Speaker, that's a summarization of the bill. I'm happy to take questions. The question before the House is shall the bill pass. Is there debate on the bill? 
If not, those in favor of passage will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no. The clerk will prepare the machine. Has every member voted? If so, the clerk will close the machine and ascertain the result on this question. There are 96 ayes, zero nays, and four members absent. A majority of members voting in the affirmative. The chair declares the bill passed. The clerk will please report the title. Committee substitute for Senate Bill 520, increasing financial penalties for ransomware attacks. Are there amendments to the title? If not, the title as read by the clerk will be and remain the title of the bill. The clerk will please communicate the action of the House to the Senate. Next bill on third reading. Committee substitute for Senate Bill 523, Transferring oversight of Jobs Investment Trust Fund to West Virginia Economic Development Authority. Are there objections to having this bill explained in lieu of having it read? If not, the gentleman of the 29th, Doug Steele, to explain the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The purpose of this bill is to move administration of the Jobs Investment Trust to the Economic Development Authority. The EDA will retain the powers and duties of the Job Investment Trust Board, and all staff currently working within JIT will remain when transitioned to the EDA. The EDA will manage all operations and has the accountability and oversight to be able to perform well. The bill will help streamline efforts relating to economic development and administration of the funds that are allocated for job investment. That is the bill, Mr. Speaker, and I urge passage. The question for the House is shall the bill pass? Is there debate on the bill? Chairman 22nd, Doug Bainer is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I ask for Rule 49 under the set of facts that I stated to the chair. Yes, sir. The gentleman has relayed to the chair that the gentleman would belong to a class of, five, of greater than five individuals impacted by the bill, and therefore it would be the direction of the chair that the gentleman should vote on this question. Question again before the House is shall the bill pass? Is there debate on the bill? If not, those in favor of passage of the bill will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no. The clerk will prepare the machine. <coughs> Has every member voted? If so, the clerk will close the machine and ascertain the result on this question. There are 96 ayes, 0 nays, and 4 members absent. Majority of members having voted in the affirmative, the chair declares that bill passed. The clerk will please support the title. Committee substitute for Senate Bill 523, transferring oversight of Jobs Investment Trust Fund to West Virginia Economic Development Authority. Are there amendments to the title? If not, the title as read by the clerk will be in remain the title of the bill. The clerk will please communicate the action of the House to the Senate. Next bill on third reading. Committee substitute for Senate Bill 537, providing additional firefighters and security guards for National Guard. Are there objections to having this bill explained in lieu of having it read? If not, the gentleman of the 29th will explain the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The purpose of this bill is to permit firefighters and security guards employed with the Adjutant General who reach age 60 and lose their military membership to continue to serve as civilian firefighters or security guards until they reach age 62. This allows persons to gain retirement benefits when they would otherwise be disqualified. The bill also permits the Adjutant General to hire civilian firefighters or security guards when conditions like deployments would require it. That is the bill, Mr. Speaker, and urge passage. The question before the House is shall the bill pass? Is there debate on the bill? If not, those in favor of passage of the bill will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no. The clerk will prepare the machine. Has every member voted? If so, the clerk will close the machine and ascertain the result on the question. There are 95 ayes, one nay, and four members absent. A majority of members voting in the affirmative. The chair declares that bill passed. The clerk will please report the title. Committee substitute for Senate Bill 537, providing additional firefighters and security guards for National Guard. Are there amendments to the title? If not, the title as read by the clerk will be and remain the title of the bill. The clerk will please communicate the action of the House to the Senate. Next bill on third reading. Senate Bill 542, transferring Broadband Enhancement Council from Department of Commerce to Department of Economic Development. Are there objections to having this bill explained in lieu of having it read? If not, the gentleman of the 29th will explain the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The purpose of this bill is to correct a minor oversight when creating the Department of Economic Development. The Broadband Enhancement Council was transferred to the Department of Economic Development, and this bill adds the Secretary as a member of the Council. That is the bill, Mr. Speaker, and urge passage. The question before the House is shall the bill pass? Is there a debate on the bill? If not, those in favor of passage, the bill will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no. The clerk will prepare the machine. Chairman the 10th, Doug Kelly. Has every member now voted? If so, the clerk will close the machine and ascertain the result on this question. There are 95 ayes, one nay, and four members absent. A majority of members voting in the affirmative. The chair declares that bill passed. The clerk will please report the title.
Senate Bill 542, transferring Broadband Enhancement Council from Department of Commerce to Department of Economic Development. Are there amendments to the title? If not, the title as read by the clerk will be in the remain the title of the bill. Lady from the 49th. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move the bill take effect from passage. Question now before the House is the motion that Senate Bill 542 take effect from passage. Those in favor of that motion will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no. The clerk will prepare the machine. Has every member voted? If so, the clerk will close the machine and ascertain the result on this question. There are 95 ayes, one nay, and four members absent. Two-thirds of members voting in the affirmative. The chair declares that bill effective for passage. The clerk will please communicate the action of the House to the Senate. Next bill on third reading. Senate Bill 597, relating to PSC underground facilities, damage prevention, and one-call system. Are there objections to having the bill explained in lieu of having it read? If not, gentlemen, 29th to explain the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The purpose of this bill is to remove an exemption for excavating work pertaining to state, county, or municipal employees. Under the Pipeline Safety, Regulatory Certainty, and Job Creation Act of 2011, West Virginia is ineligible to receive grants relating to its one call or damage prevention program because of our exemption. The bill removes the exemption to qualify the state for grants. That is the bill, Mr. Speaker, and urge passage. Question before the House is shall the bill pass? Is there debate on the bill? If not, those in favor of passage of the bill will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no. The clerk will prepare the machine. Chairman of the 30th, Doug Bates. Has every member voted? If so, the clerk will close the machine and ascertain the result. On this question, there are 96 ayes, 0 nays, and 4 members absent. A majority of members voting in the affirmative. The chair declares that bill passed. The clerk will please report the title. Senate Bill 597, relating to PSC underground facilities, damage prevention, and one call system. Are there amendments to the title? If not, the title as read by the clerk will be in the remain the title of the bill. The clerk will please communicate the action of the House to the Senate. Next bill on third reading. Committee substitute for Senate Bill 598, establishing partnerships and aid for at risk veterans to combat suicide. Are there objections to having the bill explained in lieu of having it read? If not, gentlemen, the 29th to explain the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The purpose of this bill is to direct the Department of Veterans Assistance to establish partnerships with service organizations engaged with their local veteran communities to connect veterans and their families with existing resources to combat suicide and its contributing factors among the veteran population in this state. That is the bill, Mr. Speaker, and urge passage. The question before the House is shall the bill pass? Is there debate on the bill? If not, those in favor of passage of the bill will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no. The clerk will prepare the machine. Has every member voted? If so, the clerk will close the machine and ascertain the result on this question. There were 96 ayes, 0 nays, and 4 members absent. A majority of members voting in the affirmative. The chair declares that bill passed. The clerk will please report the title. Committee substitute for Senate Bill 598 establishing partnerships and aid for at-risk veterans to combat suicide. Are there amendments to the title? If not, the title as read by the clerk will be in the remain the title of the bill. The clerk will please communicate the action of the House to the Senate. Next bill on third reading. Senate Bill 638, changing hearing and notice provisions for failing or distressed public utilities. Are there objections to having the bill explained in lieu of having it read? If not, gentlemen, 29th to explain the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The purpose of this bill is to amend the hearing and notice provisions in determining whether a utility is distressed under West Virginia Code. Under existing law, such hearings must be held in the utility service area. This bill would allow such hearings to be held within 25 miles of the utility service area, provides that the Commission must give reasonable notice of the time, place, and subject matter of the hearing, and removes the requirement that such notice be issued through Class I legal advertisements. That is the bill, Mr. Speaker, and urge passage. The question before the House is shall the bill pass? Is there debate on the bill? If not, those in favor of passage of the bill will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no. The clerk will prepare the machine. Has every member voted? If so, the clerk will close the machine and ascertain the result. On this question, there are 82 ayes, 14 nays, and four members absent. Majority of members voting in the affirmative. The chair declares that bill passed. The clerk will please report the title. Senate Bill 638, changing hearing and notice provisions for failing or distressed public utilities. Are there amendments to the title? 
If not, the title as read by the clerk will be and remain the title of the bill. The clerk will please communicate the action of the House to the Senate. Are there other bills on third reading? If not, bills on second reading. Committee substitute for Senate Bill 524, placing duties and functions of certain boards and commissions under Department of Arts, Culture, and History. Are there amendments? Delegate Zukoff, Young, Hanson, Desario, and Hornbuckle move to amend the bill on page 19, section 8C, line 141, 181, following the number four, by inserting a new sentence to read as follows. Any existing rules promulgated pursuant to chapter 29A of this code under the authority of the Library Commission prior to the enactment of this section shall remain in full force and effect until amended by the authority provided pursuant to this section. Question before the House is the adoption of the amendment just read by the clerk. Let him the fourth Doug Zukoff. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to um, withdraw that amendment, please. To withdraw the amendment just read by the clerk? Yes. Okay. Are there objections? Okay, no objections are heard. That amendment will be withdrawn. Clerk will please report the next amendment. Delegates Zukoff, Young, Hansen, Desario, and Hornbuckle move to amend the bill on page 7, section 1, line 151, following the period by inserting a new subsection to read as follows. S, the amendments enacted by Senate Bill 524 during the 2022 regular session of the legislature become effective July 1st, 2023. Question now before the House is the adoption of the amendment just read by the clerk. Is there a debate on the amendment? Okay, Gentleman 29, Douglas Steele. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I urge rejection of the amendment. The amendment seeks to basically change the entire intent of the bill, uh, which right now there are certain deficiencies uh, in funding that are created by a loss in census numbers that by movement of this commission, uh, the governor's office will be able to better uh, put in backstop funding uh, by delaying this for an entire another year. That places our county uh, public libraries in jeopardy. So I'd, I'd urge rejection of the amendment. Is there debate on the amendment? Lady before fourth Dr. Zukov is recognized. This simply changes the date and gives it time for the new rules to be established and for the, um, it doesn't change the funding, it changes the date. Um, we've been told that the funding is going to stay the same. Um, so I just believe that this gives enough time for the new rules to be made and that it um, makes it effective next fiscal year. Thank you. Question again is only amendment is read by the clerk. Is there is there further debate on the amendment? If not, the question again is shall the amendment be adopted? Those in favor of adoption of the amendment read by the clerk will please say aye. Aye. Those opposed will please say no. No. And those appear to have it. Okay, the no's have it. Chair declares that amendment lost. Clerk will report the next amendment. Delegate Steele moves to amend the bill on page 19, section 8C, line 196, by creating a new subsection with the following language. J, any rules promulgated by the Library Commission will remain in full force and effect until amended, repealed, or superseded by another rule promulgated by the Library Commission or State Library Section. Question now before the House is the adoption of the amendment just read by the clerk. Is there debate on the amendment? Gentleman 29, Doug Steele. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This amendment was offered to address some concerns about the current rules of the Library Commission being carried over to where it will be under the office of the curator. This is just to maintain continuity and uh, make sure that the procedural rules and other administrative rules of the agency remain in place so there's no disruption of services. That's the amendment, Mr. Speaker, and I urge adoption. Is there further debate on the amendment? If not, those in favor of adoption of the amendment read by the clerk will please say aye. aye. As opposed, will please say no. The ayes have it. Chair declares that amendment adopted. Are there other amendments? If not, the bill will be advanced to third reading. Next bill on second reading. Committee substitute for Senate Bill 650, eliminating number of royalty owners required for utilization by operator for lawful use and development by co-tenants. Are there amendments? If not, the bill will be advanced. Are there further bills on second reading? If not, bills on first reading. Committee substitute for Senate Bill 515, supplementing and amending appropriations of public monies 
to Department of Administration Public Defender Services. Bill will be advanced. Senate Bill 517, expiring funds from unappropriated balance in state excess lottery revenue fund. Bill will be advanced. Senate Bill 525, expiring funds from unappropriated balance in lottery net profits. Bill will be advanced. Senate Bill 526, supplementing and amending appropriations to Department of Commerce Office of Secretary. Bill will be advanced. Senate Bill 527, supplementing and amending appropriations to Department of Administration Office of Technology. Bill will be advanced. Senate Bill 531, increasing annual salaries of certain state employees. Bill will be advanced. Senate Bill 626, supplementing, amending, and increasing existing items of appropriation from state road fund to DOT DMV. Bill will be advanced. Senate Bill 627, supplementing, amending, and increasing existing item of appropriation from state road fund to DOT DOH. Bill will be advanced. Senate Bill 628, supplementing and amending appropriations to Department of Commerce, DNR. Bill will be advanced. Senate Bill 629, supplementing and amending appropriations to Department of Education, West Virginia Board of Education, Vocational Division. Bill will be advanced. Senate Bill 630, supplementing and amending appropriations to Higher Education Policy Commission, Administration, Control Count. Bill will be advanced. Senate Bill 636, supplementing and amending appropriations to Department of Revenue, Office of Tax Appeals. Bill will be advanced. Senate Bill 637, supplementing and amending appropriations to Executive Governor's Office, Civil Contingent Fund. The bill will be advanced. Are there other bills on first reading? If not, leaves of absence, lay from the 49th. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For our colleagues, delegates, Householder, Espinoza, Hamrick, and Painter. Are there objections to leaves being granted? If not, leaves of absence shall be granted. Introductions? Introductions. Miscellaneous business. Chairman from the 11th, Dr. Keaton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I ask unanimous consent that the remarks by the gentleman from the 55th on the passage of House Concurrent Resolution 31 be recorded and printed in the appendix of the journal. Are there objections? No objections are heard. Is there other miscellaneous business? Let Jeremy Third like a flu hearty. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My stuff's getting knocked around here. I would ask that all discussion relating to House Concurrent Resolution 31 be print printed in the appendix of the journal. Objections are heard. <laughs> oh, come on. Well, you love the Constitution and debate and everything. Not, not so much now? All right. It, I'll. Re I'll reform that, Mr. Speaker, and I'll ask that the comments by the gentleman from the 36th be printed in the appendix in the journal. Are there objections to that? No objections are heard. Is there other miscellaneous business? If not, laid in the 49th. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move subject to announcements the House adjourn until 10 a.m. Saturday, March 5th. Question is on the motion that's subject to announcements. The House stand to adjourn until 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Are there announcements, Lady from the 49th? Mr. Speaker, your Committee on Rules will meet at 945 Saturday morning behind the chamber. Gentleman of the 10th, Dr. Chris. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Finance Committee will meet tomorrow, tomorrow after the floor session and lunch will be provided. Gentleman of the 32nd, Dr. Fast. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your Committee on Judiciary will meet today at 1.30 p.m. in the House Judiciary Committee Room. The agenda is posted. In addition, your Committee on Judiciary will meet in the morning tomorrow, 8.30 a.m. in the House Committee uh, Room, and the agenda will be posted. Chairman of the 51st, Dr. Staller. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your Committee on Education will meet Saturday, March the 5th at 8.30 a.m. The agenda will be posted. Republicans will caucus with the, in the Chairman's office at 8.15. Chairman the 15th, Doug Foster. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your Committee on Government Organization will meet tomorrow at 9 a.m. in the Government Organization Committee Room, 9 a.m. in the Government Organization Committee Room tomorrow. The agenda will be posted. Also, Mr. Speaker, your Committee on Government Org Organization will meet Monday, March 7th at 3 p.m. in the Government Organization Room, and the agenda will be posted. Chairman of the 10th, Dr. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good afternoon. Your Committee on Energy and Manufacturing will host a public hearing on Monday, March 7th at 9 a.m. in the House Chambers regarding Senate Bill 694. Those wishing to speak can sign up beginning at 8.30 a.m. Monday morning in the House Chamber. Thank you. Are there further announcements at this time? If not, the question is on the motion that the House stand adjourned until 10 o'clock in the morning. Those in favor will please say aye. aye. As opposed to please say no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. We are adjourned until 10 o'clock tomorrow morning.